I just want to thank you for coming tonight. My name is Nancy Horowitz. I am the director of the Elie Wiesel Center for Jewish Studies. Uh, the event tonight is co-sponsored by the center and by the program in Hebrew at Boston University. Um, I just want to say I'm really personally very excited to be bringing this event to BU. When I saw the film, I was completely blown away by it, to use academic language. Uh, I think it's very, very interesting. It's evocative. It makes us think about Genesis, it makes us think about space, it makes us think about the parameters of society and what we know in society and how sometimes those boundaries can expand. Um, I just want to introduce Mira Angris now, and I want to thank her for bringing the program to our attention. Mira is a master lecturer in the program of Hebrew in the Department of World Languages and Literatures, and she is going to introduce the film and the speakers. And let me also thank our staff at the Ellie Wiesel Center, Jeremy Solomons and Teresa Cooney, who have done all of this legwork to make this possible. So thank you all for coming. Uh, it's nice to see familiar faces. My students are here, my friends, colleagues. So Erev Tov, and uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here tonight to share the experience of viewing a unique cinematic creation, a docu the documentary film Space Torah, or in Hebrew, Torah B'Chalal. Uh, by happy coincidence, uh, this week we also celebrated the Jewish holiday of Simchat Torah. Uh, as some of you know, or maybe all of you know, Jews around the world read the entire Torah cover to cover every year. Simchat Torah, who was, cel was celebrated yesterday, Monday evening and, yes, and Tuesday, uh, marks the end of the year's reading uh, of the complete Sefer Torah. What could be more fitting? The film uh, Space Torah recounts the journey of MIT professor, Dr. Jeff Hoffman, who is with us here today, who carried and read a Torah in space. Dr. Hoffman um, is a veteran of five space shuttle missions. He served as a NASA astronaut since 1978 till 1997. Among other important contributions to science and the field of space exploration, Dr. Hoffman is a faculty member in MIT, wanted Afro Africa Aero Astro program. He's also the first astronaut uh, to carry a Torah scroll into space. While in orbit, Dr. Hoffman read part of the book of Genesis aloud. The film tells a moving story of this land landmark intersection of science and spirit. Also joining us tonight is uh, the film executive uh, producer, Rachel Raz, or as I call her, Rachel Raz, who is also a friend of mine. Uh, Rachel is the founder of the Space Tora Project and the executive producer of the film. She is a very well-known Jewish educator and educator and entrepreneur or founder of multiple initiatives with Global Reach. Uh, Rachel is a consultant uh, and a frequent invited speaker, invited speaker for many organizations. She is new to the movie business and her first film is sure to be a hit. Uh, after we're gonna, we're gonna uh, show, screen the movie, and uh, following the movie, uh, the movie is about 25 minutes. Uh, I'll moderate a brief uh, panel discussion with Rachel and Jeff. Uh, I'll get the ball rolling with a few questions of my own, and then we'll give you a chance to ask and uh, develop a conversation. So, without further ado, maybe we can see the film. Or do you want to say something, Rachel or Jeff, before? We can see the film, and I'm sure it's going to generate a lot of, a lot of uh, questions and good discussion. So enjoy. It's Shabbat morning in Jerusalem and Shabbat evening back in Houston, Texas. This is a very special Shabbat in space. In the 50s, when I was a little boy, instead of playing cowboys and Indians, I used to play space raiders with my best friend. Actually, when I became an astronaut, he came to my first launch and he said he couldn't believe that the little boy that he had played space rangers with is now going up into space. 
we astronauts are human beings and when we travel like all explorers we bring with us parts of our culture our history our traditions when people ask what was the most significant thing that i felt i ever did i would always say rescuing repairing the hubble space telescope I mean, Judaism has the tradition of tikkun olam, to repair the world. Without our care and attention, things deteriorate, and to fix them is an important mitzvah. This is a special Torah. But I think a lot of people don't appreciate what it went through. It was sitting, along with me, of course, on top of four and a half million pounds of high explosive. And then you light the fuse, about a minute into the flight, you break the sound barrier going straight up. And then after two minutes, the Torah and I were now in orbit. Reading the book of Exodus, the revelation of the Torah at Mount Sinai, and that somehow it came down from heaven to Moses. So now we have a Torah that went back to heaven. There is this beautiful concept, Torah min hashamayim, Torah from heaven. The full phrase is Torah from heaven as refracted through generations. It's something that goes back thousands of years, and yet this is something that we take with us also into the future, because as it says, you teach your children to read it and your children will teach their children, and that's how we keep going into the future. Ask uh, uh, Rachel and uh, Jeff a few questions, and then you will be able to ask questions as well. Okay, I will. I will. Sorry. So, Rachel, uh, you are the founder of this wonderful Space Torah project, and I was wondering if you could share with us how did it all start? What inspired you? How did you meet Jeff? How did you come up with the idea? And uh, maybe at the same token, tell us what were your goals and if you feel like you've achieved a part, all of them. Thank you, thank you, Miran. It's great to be here. So uh, sometimes their stars are aligned in a way uh, to bring us to people. So in 2016, uh, I used to work at Hebrew College, not too far from here. And a colleague of mine said to me that a Jewish astronaut is coming to give a talk. And I never heard about Jeff. I didn't know anything about him. But I never met an astronaut either, Jewish or not Jewish. And I was really curious because there is not many of them around the world. So I was very curious to go and meet an astronaut. And uh, again, with no expectation. So I was sitting in the crowd like you. And then Jeff started talking about the fact that he went on five space missions. So I was surprised. I didn't know that you can go on five space missions. It's like coming and going. It's just that was new to me. Um, <laughs> and then that he fixed the Hubble telescope. And I was very impressed and vo very inspired. Um, and then he shared that on his first flight, it was the holiday of Passover. And he wanted to take a matzah. Um, and we know what happened to matzah on Earth, you know, all of the crumbs fall on the ground and on the table, but in space, they float. So it, it didn't get the okay for that. Um, and then he also shared some photos uh, when he took mezuzot on his, its, its flight and he put them where he slept. Um, and then like very casually, he started talking about uh, taking um, about the Hanukkah and he showed us a short video. And then he, he showed us the five minutes uh, video when he unfolded and read from the Torah. And I was sitting in the crowd and I was like surprised, shocked, inspired in so many ways. And the film itself, the five minutes that he shared with us, um, I'm an educator, so I, I identified so many different things in these five minutes that if I had to write a script to Jeff, it will be that. Because he spoke about the member of his community. So for me, it's the power of community. He spoke about his father, so we were talking about you know, the parents' involvement. 
Later on, with all of the questioning I learned about his teacher, so the power of, of teachers, and the rabbis, and there were so many elements that came together, and there was this sentence, a couple of sentences, uh, one of them in particular, when he said, we astronaut, um, like all human beings, when we travel, we take with us our culture and tradition, and for me it was a universal message for every one of us. Where are we coming from? What are we taking with us? What are we proud of? So when I heard all of these things, I really wanted to run out and use this short five minutes uh, footage and share it with my students, with educators, and to share it with as many people. And for my surprise, when I asked Jeff where I can find this footage, he said, nowhere, it's on my computer. <laughs> and I said to him, what do you mean? That was 1996, we are in 2016, 20 years after, what do you mean? No Google, no YouTube, no. He said on my computer, and I really felt obligation in some way. How do I make sure that it's not staying on Jeff's computer? <laughs> to make sure that we all have access to it. So I asked Jeff, are you open to make a documentary film? Uh, I, 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 I didn't know Rachel from anyone, and you know, a lot of people come, come up and ask me to do things, so politely I said, well, um, sure, if, if it could be done professionally. I, I should say, um, when when I had uh, spun the dreidel, and I, I mentioned in the film that a, a professional uh, television a studio picked it up, uh, and and you know they that then became accessible to people all over the world on on YouTube. Um, but I had lost contact with those people. I, in fact, I had uh, shortly after that flight, I. NASA sent me over to uh, France to be the diplomatic representative in Europe for four years, and by the time I got back, I had kind of lost touch, and and so yeah, it just sat on on my computer until Rachel came along, and I'll pass it back to you now. Yes, yeah, so I went home and I sat at home and with my husband, and I told him about what I just saw and heard, and I said I must do something about it. And he said, he looked at me and he said, so do something about it. Because you know me, I, I, I am a doer. Uh, but I never done a film in my life, so I knew that I have to learn a lot. And I started doing lots of homework, asking one person who knows, somebody that knows how to make a film. And I was very fortunate that a member from my congregation connected me with Rob Cooper, the director. Um, and Rob uh, and Verissima Production been doing a documentary film for over three decades, I think. Um, and immediately when I told him what I want to do, we met, he said to me, sure, we will do it. Even though at that time I was expert in early childhood education, uh, I didn't have funding, but he recognized that this is an important story to tell, and he said, sure, let's do it. Um, and then uh, Ruth Gold is here in the crowd. She helped me with fundraising and a few other people. That's why we had the, the long uh, list. It's like, okay, ha, what, what do you need to do to make a film? So that was part of the project of finding the right people, raising the fund. Later on, uh, when the film was done, I knew that it's not enough to finish a film. You need um, to learn how to share it with the world. So I took a, a class about distribution with about 200 other filmmakers from around the globe, which was fascinating. Uh, and now the film, you know, talking about some achievements, so it has been to almost 40 film festivals in 10 countries. Um, they, I work with the Ministry of Education in Israel and it's part of the curriculum for ninth and 10th grade. I've uh, been doing screening like this uh, around the globe and some of them on Zoom with Jewish and non-Jewish community because there is all of this universal message that go to that. So yes, you ask me, so this is about the journey. Some of my goals was, is first of all, was to make sure that it's not on his computer anymore. To it still is on my computer. Yes, but it's on mine, it's on mine, it's on Vimeo, it's on Rob's, and it's on many other people. I also send it to the a National Library of Israel, so it will be there, because I think it's something that everybody should have access to it and to make sure that we preserve it. And um, so this was one goal. The other thing was actually to inspire and to bring this story to more people, because as much as the story is fascinating about Jeff, but there's many messages for each one of us are on our own journey to think about what are we doing, what do we want to achieve, who is part of our ecosystem of growing, who is our favorite third grade teacher that encourages us, 
if we are parents, what are we doing to help our children along these journeys? So there are many messages beyond this story, but for every one of us here. So these were some of my okay. goals and achievements. And I imagine you use a, the screening and the discussion for educational programs. Uh, Jeff, I was wondering uh, how how did your fellow astronaut respond or feel when you read from the Torah, all those acts of reading from the Torah, uh, recite the blessing, playing with the dreidel and putting the mezuzah up? And I was, I was also wondering if any of your fellow astronauts shared their traditional cultures or their journeys while they were in space. That's a lot of questions. Um, <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, oh, okay, let's let's see. Um, how did I share the mezuzahs with, uh, you know, and what did people think of this? Well, first of all, let me talk about uh, the the filming, because um, you know, obviously, it it was videoed and and somebody had to work that. So. It turned out on, on that flight, uh, we were on two shifts. There were seven people on board, but four of them were asleep, which was good, because I wanted it at an, a nice, quiet time. Uh, and and the three, of the three of us who were awake, one was just downstairs doing something. So I asked uh, Claude Nicolier, a Swiss astronaut, one of my best friends, if he would, I said, I, I want to do a little ceremony. Uh, could, could you video it? He's not Jewish. Um, so he did, and, and when it was all finished, he said to me, Jeff, I have absolutely no idea what you were doing there, but it looked very impressive. <laughs> and so that was, that was Claude's take on it, and, and nobody else saw it. There have been other people, I mean, there, there's certainly um, Buzz Aldrin, when he landed on the moon, he, he uh, performed a communion. That, he was public about that. That was, that was his uh, expression of, of his religious tradition and you know we've had people from just about every religion in the world and people have taken sacred texts up or or symbols of of their cultures in in many different ways so um, as, as I said in the film and as Rachel pointed out the, the the point is that that we are not we're not robots you know we're human beings, and and so we celebrate our cultures in in different ways. I will share one story about the mezuzah, though, because um, I, I did take a mezuzah on every flight. Now you cannot nail a mezuzah to the door of the space shuttle. Okay, that that would be a bad deal. So, like in many things, you have to make certain compromises, and so we use Velcro. Well, on on. The, my final flight, as I said, we were we were a two shift flight, and they only had four bunks, so so you have to share bunks with with other people. And I, I was in the longest bunk because I'm I'm tall, and and so I thought, well, it would be you know, instead of putting the mezuzah on the door, why don't I put it just on the door of of the bunk where I sleep? But you know, somebody else is going to sleep there the next on the next shift, and I, I don't want to impose my tradition on them, so I would remove it every morning when I got up and put it in my pocket, and then I'd put it in when, before I went to sleep. Except, I guess one day I forgot and must have left it there because there's about an hour after you know one shift wakes up, you, you, you're all awake at the same time, and uh, the person who had slept in, in the same bunk uh, floated over to me and said, "Hey, Jeff, that was that was a really nice touch having a mezuzah on on the sleep compartment." And I said, "It's it's Scott Horowitz, another Jew." So after that, we left the mezuzah on on the sleep station, and and we both shared it. Nice. I would let you now, if you want to ask a few questions, uh, Jay, you can ask Jeff or Rachel. Uh, just let me know who is interested in. Who's going to be brave and ask the first question? That's yeah. that's what we all well, wait for. Hi, I have a question. Um, you said your partner videotaped you, so obviously it wasn't on an iPhone that he videotaped no, you. No, no, we we use the NASA had video cameras, cameras. and, and yeah, we use the standard cameras. NASA video camera. 
which unfortunately in those nowadays everything is high def and so on. Back back then it was not, unfortunately. So the the video quality is not up to what we normally expect these days. But you know, you 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 use what you have at the time. I have another question. Were you you asked that it would be a professional film, and were you pleased with the outcome? Don't you think so? Yeah, oh, it's I think it's fantastic. I yeah, I mean, I, I was, uh, you know, I'd, I'd never, I've, I've done a lot of filming and videos and stuff, but never being right in the middle of something like this. So it was, it was great working with the professionals, and, and they did a great job. Mm -hmm. I, I, can, I can add to it. I was nervous, actually, because I had a vision. I knew what some of the part will be, but I really gave total freedom in some way to Rob. And, um, but I also did the fundraising, so I felt obligated to the people that supported the film, and I felt obligated to Jeff to, to produce something that will be appropriate and good. And, uh, and sometimes it was like a little bit nervous, you know, will we be able to create something that will be worthwhile? Um, will the quality uh, be good? And I remember the first time that Rob sent me the first version of it, I saw it and I was so pleased and relieved that immediately I gave him a call and I said, Rob, this was like wonderful. And later on when I heard it with the music, uh, Billy Novak that wrote the music, the way he tied it, you know, there's some tune that every time that I hear them, I kind of something touched uh, in me. So it's, he really did the brilliant work of putting it all together and he brought a wonderful team. Uh, that all felt very committed to do it. So, so I also, I'm, I'm very thrilled with the outcome, thanks to Rob, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the, sound, the sound was amazing. This was particularly good sound quality. I, I heard something I had never heard before in that little scene where we were playing with the electric trains, just kind of in the background you could hear choo, 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 you know, the just sound of trains. I had never heard that before. So, I mean, yeah, they, they, they had original music for it. I mean, it, it was truly professional. It was really, really a good job. I, I was delighted. First of all, it's nice to finally see the film after hearing about it from Rachel. Um, so I have two questions. One is, um, if I remember the story correctly, you, you actually spoke at Hebrew College, and that's where Rachel met you. So I was curious how you got invited to speak to begin with. And the other is, I'm, I, I'm into, I but I have another question too. I noticed details. So when you're being interviewed in the film, there's like this plexiglass thing next to you. Is that your desk or what is that? Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, so oh that's, um, yeah, the, 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 the uh, sitting next to me, there was a little glass thing with, with reflected lights. Um, my, um, my parents collected glass, and that was one of their prized collections, um, which I inherited. And it, it's a, a glass sculpture, uh, and when you look into it, if you look closely, I, it, it's like looking into another world, because they have all these prisms and all the light reflecting around it, and uh, Rob kind of liked it as just sort of being over to the side, that it gave a little bit of visual interest. So that's what it was. Yeah, Rob had lots of, one of his vision was to bring us to the Museum of Science for some of the recording, which was really neat to be there after hours and uh, that the museum was just for us. A about the question what he was doing at Hebrew College, so it was actually part of the winter uh, rabbinical school uh, seminar. Uh, they were talking about science and space and uh, religion. So he was a guest speaker. Later on, the year after, I actually invited Jeff to come to the conference, the educator conference that I chaired, uh, because I wanted more educators to get to be inspired. So, um, so you were at Hebrew College twice. I, I think I saw that, yeah. that presentation. You were, there, right, you were yeah. there, yeah. Before the film was done. Um, so that was amazing, I want to say, but also my question is, so at the beginning of the film, while you were a child, you had said that it's always been a dream of yours to go to space and you were all into the astronomy. I'm wondering, when did the Judaism part come into it? Like, was it really special for you 
and you wanted to become more Jewish once you did that, or I saw that you were reformed. I don't know if you had always felt really connected or space brought you to the connection of being Jewish. Well, I mean, being, being Jewish was always part of my life. So, yeah. I mean, it's almost like in parallel. Uh, I, I didn't at the time equate Judaism in any way with space flight, right. okay? I mean, <laughs> that the, makes sense. Flash Gordon, as far as I know, was not Jewish, and he, you know, he was one of my childhood heroes. So it, it was almost like uh, something in in parallel. You know, I, I I went to religious school and bar mitzvah and confirmation and and so on. Um, it wasn't really connected with astrophysics and you know what I eventually went on to study. That was you know what was I think very special for me in, in this was when I did bring the two worlds together, you know, Judaism is an ancient tradition, you know, thousands of years old, and to bring it together with space flight, which for me always represented the future, you know, something that's new, and, and I, I was always interested. And, and that's when I, I started, what started me thinking about that was when I on my first flight when, it, as they said in the movie, the rabbi asked if I wanted to take some uh, Jewish ceremonial objects, and, and, and I did. And, and then I realized there was this juxtaposition of these, you know, the very old and the very new, and, and to me that, that had a lot of significance. Thank you. Any more questions? I have two questions. So the first one was, uh, like, since you've been on five space missions, uh, did you bring something Jewish every time? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Um, I, I always had mezuzahs. Um, as they said, I bought the atarot for my um, children's uh, uh, talasim, that, you know, the little, uh, little message that um, for... <laughs> For one of them, it was uh, the message of Elijah going up into space on the fiery chariot, which seemed appropriate. And then, and then the other one, uh, our son's youngest son's name is Orin. I wanted to call him Orion, but my wife objected, <laughs> and so he went. He went for about because Orion is my favorite constellation, and and he went for about a week without any name. And then my mother, bless her. Um, suggested, well, why don't you just take an O out and and it'll be Orin, which which is which turns out to be quite a common Hebrew name, you know, pine tree and and so. On. Anyway, um, uh, so for him, there's a passage in um, the you know the 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 trials of of Job and and when the voice from the world whirlwind about. Can, I forget exactly how it goes, but can you make the, the constellations move, the stars of Orion, something like that? And, and so that's, that's the passage we used for him. Um, I've taken a Kiddush cup. Unfortunately, I couldn't fill it with wine. Um, and, and a few other uh, ceremonial objects, yeah. Um, and also, in your various missions with your various makeups of like uh, colleagues and fellow astronauts, did you like face any criticisms, anti-Semitism, or uh, zero? From? Nothing, not not at all. I, I have to say, I mean, um, in, in the astronaut office, it, it's a it's a pretty technical uh, life. You know, we're we're training hard, we're doing things. Um, I, I think some some of the people who, you know, there were. Some people who went to church together, and I'm sure they, they probably talked about religion, and, and I knew there were a few other Jewish astronauts, although I, I think none, one of them came to our synagogue. Yeah, one of them did. Um, but in general, no, it wasn't something we, we normally discuss, and certainly there was no discrimination or any, anything like that. I would like to add something about one of my goal was to share a positive story, American story, how you can succeed and achieve great things, no matter what's your background and religion. And for me, I'm also an immigrant to this country and I'm very thankful for what this country is giving me. And I think we don't share enough of the successful stories. 
We focus on the negative and we see it all the time, but if you look around this room and if you look around this country, there are so many phenomenal stories and successful stories. Um, and I was trying through this one, you know, at least to bring one and, and to have this kind of conversation. And I still believe that America is a wonderful place that we can achieve great things. We can come from lots of background, colors, race, and all of that. Um, and I hope that this, if we come together, the parents and the children and the educators and our clergy and, and all of us working together, we can achieve great things. And that was one of the mission also of, of this film. Also say your name so it gets more personal. Hello, hi, Dr. Hoffman. Thank you for speaking with us this evening and your contributions towards science. Um, my name's Hannah. I'm currently studying marine science. So I was marine science. Marine science yes. So I was elated to learn um, that Dr. Megan MacArthur, the woman oceanographer had the opportunity to, like you, repair the Hubble Space Telescope. So thank you not only for paving that way, but I was wondering, my question is, how do you define the intersection between space exploration and then ocean science? We actually, um, as part of our training before a space flight, we had a lot of lectures about what we were going to see um, because we take a lot of pictures and they wanted to make us intelligent photographers, not just sort of snapping pictures at random. So we get lectures on geology, we get lectures on meteorology, uh, on ethnography to, to look at the you know, influence of civilization and, and uh, the structure of cities and so on, which you can see from space, and on oceanography. So, um, you know, we we got a lot of lectures on, you know, these are the the eddies that get spun off from the Gulf Stream. You know, take try to take some pictures of those, and and they had some, um, you know, underwater uh, soliton waves in the Andaman Sea. That can you try to get a picture of that? And I I remember. On, on my third flight, um, the commander and I were, were up on the, the flight deck looking out the window, and we got this message up on the, the teleprinter saying that, uh, you know, at such and such a time in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, there's going to be, there's a big uh, wave front uh, between two fronts of water, and, and could you try to take a picture of it? And we waited and waited, and, you know, wh what are they talking about? And then all of a sudden, coming over the horizon, this huge line, you know, tens of miles long that, that you could see. Um, there, there's actually a, a little pamphlet which uh, NASA put out, oh, probably 30 years ago, called Oceanography from Space. I don't know if it's still available, um, but get, get my email from there, and, and I, I would be delighted. I'm not going to use the copy. I'm, be happy to send it to you. Thank you. So. Bet you didn't think you were going to get that long an answer. No, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. And I'm sorry I didn't ask you before to just uh, say your name and maybe what you study here at BU and to make those connections. Anyone else has a question or a response? I would like. Okay, I want. Oh. Rachel, could you talk about um, what you're doing with the Ministry of Education in Israel? And also, I know you've shown the film to some synagogues and Hebrew schools, but do you have other larger educational goals? So, so as I shared earlier, when I met Jeff, I left the room and I knew that I don't want to keep this story with me. I wanted to make sure that more and more people will be inspired uh, all over the world, Jews and non-Jews, and really make all of us think about these great things that we can achieve and, and we can do. So um, the first goal was to make the film, but making the film is not enough. 
you need to really uh, bring it out there for people to know about it. It's lots of work to get it to the next level. And I was trying to identify who are some key organizations to get through them. Uh, so one of them was the Ministry of Education in Israel, which they uh, we worked together and we, we designed this uh, curriculum. And now I hope to translate it to English so schools around the globe can use it. I also work with the Ministry of Diaspora that work with communities around the world. I was recently in Australia for something else and, and I shared it with them. Um, so the idea is to, to share it with as many people as possible. And in March, we're planning to go to Israel um, to, to share you know, the story and, and to give them the opportunity to meet Jeff. Uh, Jeff was in Israel before and they met him, but I think before they really knew your Jewish journey uh, as much uh, through this film. So, yeah. Oh, I, I will say, uh, it was in 19, late 1996, uh, after that flight, and, and I, at that point, had the Torah reading on my computer, and I was in Israel, and I visited a friend, this is the one I was telling you about, who lives outside Tel Aviv, who we were, had been at graduate school together, and he was also a well-known astrophysicist um, at, at Tel Aviv University, and, and I, I spent an evening with them and uh, showed the video. It wasn't a whole film, of course. It was just the actual video of the ceremony in, in space. And I remember they all said to me at that time, you, you've got to share this. You've got, and that was, it took 20 years, um, but we finally did. So I'm looking forward when we go back, I, I, I want to visit him again and, and say, yes, I took your advice. We finally did share it, thanks to Rachel. Yeah, so, so yeah, the idea is, is to share it wide. Um, I, I have to give another credit to Rob Cooper, when, when he, the, our director, that he said, you know, call it the Space Tour Project. So then it's not just about the film, but it's an ongoing living project that it's growing. So we do have the spacetorproject.com website that this recording from tonight will be there and other recording and a, some educator developed curriculum. We have, uh, we found later on a fax that, that uh, Jeff sent from space in, in uh, 1996 before and after he read from the Torah. So I want to make sure that all of this will be documented. It will be a place that everybody can search and can find. So it's a living, breathing, growing um, project. So uh, the idea is that it will, it will live beyond the, the film and it will, we will document more things. And every time that I sit here together with Jeff, uh, I learn something new. Like today I actually learned that he biked around the world uh, from space. So maybe you can tell us about that. What is the new thing I learned today? <laughs> Well, they, they always provide, you know, astronauts basically, you know, we want to be in good shape so people exercise, and, and so they provide exercise equipment on the space shuttle. I, I, I have to say, on, on my first flight, I, I ran on the treadmill because everybody was doing it, and of course, to run on a treadmill, you, you can't do it while you're floating, so you have to put on a harness and bungee cords to pull yourself down. And, <laughs> And, and you know, I was on it for about 20 minutes, and when, um, when I released the bungee cords and I floated up, I realized, you know, while I was running on this treadmill, I felt like I was back on Earth. I don't need that. I'm going to be on Earth for the rest of my life, and that's the last time I ever exercised in space, which, if you're only up for one or two weeks, you can do without exercise. If you're up for six months on the space day, I don't want to you know, um, denigrate the value of exercise, because if you're up in space for a long time, you've got to exercise or else your muscles deteriorate, your bo you lose bone mass and so on. There's a lot of medical problems in long duration space flight, which we didn't have to deal with on the shuttle. But they, they did on some flights, in addition to the treadmill, they would have a bicycle ergometer. And I'm a avid bicycle rider. I, I ride to work every day. I, I like to, to go on longer rides over the weekends. And so uh, this was actually on the flight where we were fixing Hubble. Um, after everything was finished, we had one extra day. That was the day when I was spinning the dreidel. But before that, I had set up the bicycle in such a way that I could look out the window and watch the Earth go by. And, and as I pedaled, I could pretend that I was actually propelling the shuttle at, at 
20, you know, 18,000 miles an hour, and I wanted to ride around the whole world, so I did. And, and then there's a question. Do you, if you, if you just go one orbit, um, but the Earth has turned, so, so you really haven't, I, I wanted, so I actually, instead of just riding one orbit, I kept riding, I started when we crossed the Greenwich Meridian, and I figured I'll, I'll keep riding for another five minutes or so until we get to the Greenwich Meridian again. So I really did ride around the world. Um, any thoughts of translating it into other languages? So we already have a Hebrew translation. And when it was in a film festival in Russia, they, they had a subtitle in Russian. So I'm sure that uh, when it will get to other non-English speaking, it will get uh, subtitles. Right. Yeah. Yes, in Boston we had it in collaboration with the Museum of Science uh, at the Omni Theater. That was like one of you know when when I had. Uh, yeah, it, it's like, it's like when we finished the film, I said to Jeff, I have three big goals for, for screening. One of them is to do an event at the Museum of Science at the Omni Theater in collaboration with the Jewish Film Festival, which we did, which was very exciting after COVID, you know, to have the Omni Theater, all of us together, and to actually bring the story, you know, you took the Torah to space and now to bring, spa you know, to bring them together at the Museum of Science. The other one was to go to Houston, where the community of the Space Torah is and NASA. And we did this uh, in March or April last year. And the third one that I said to Jeff that I really want to do is to go to Israel. So, and we are going. So, so it's, it's also, it's like taking, you know, having like a roadmap with some goals and taking them one step after the other, like somebody asked me when it will be like on a, a pay as you, you know, like a, another platform. And I said, we have a map and we're getting there. So I'm um, putting some goals and achieving them and it's, uh, it's wonderful. And, and people should, should realize you, you can't right now get access this on YouTube or anything because it's still, making the rounds of some film festivals and the rules for film festivals are the, the film cannot have been publicly released. So once it goes on YouTube, then, then you can't go to film festivals anymore. And it's done quite well at the film festivals. It's won a few prizes. Yeah. But if anyone here wants, if anyone here wants access and you want to share it, you can email me. I can give you my email and I'll be happy to send you a link. And maybe you can share it with friends. There are synagogues back at home who would like to invite uh, Rachel. I'm, I'm going to definitely talk to my parents-in-law in Pittsburgh and see whether they want to invite you there. So, uh, yes, yeah, spread out the world, uh, the world, and I'm sure that many other people would uh, benefit from watching the film and mostly meeting the two of you. I mean, it's different to watch a movie, but, and it's another thing to watch the star of the movie and the producer of the movie. It's great, isn't it? Well, this is, this is special, and, and you know, I, the film has been showed in many places, and, and Rachel has gone to a lot more of them than I have. I, you know, there's a limit to how much we can travel. Yeah, we but, are lucky that you are Well, local. but this is BU, you know, we're all neighbors here. I'm over the river on the other side, so so I figured this this definitely was something that I, I wanted to come we to in person. We appreciate that, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>